typical approach to Dennis, cases like Dennis's, has been uh, in many cases to sort of start with what we call a rule of sevens. And, and by that, what we mean is that kids under the age of seven generally are incapable of making any kind of meaningful medical decision. That kids 14 and above uh, have a rebuttable presumption of capacity to make these sorts of decisions. In other words, we should start with the assumption that they might be able to do this, uh, but that it's rebuttable if we find evidence that they're really not mature enough to make the decision, then we don't allow them to do it. And then finally, between 7 and 14, um, we have a rebuttable presumption that they do not have the capacity to make a decision, but that may also be overridden by evidence to the contrary, depending on uh, the stakes of the decision and, and, and how complex the decision is. Um, and so when, when we look at Dennis from that perspective, the questions we really ask is, does Dennis have this sort of um, equipment to make uh, a thoughtful decision about this issue? And, and many people felt that he did. My own take on Dennis's case is that the principle of beneficence really uh, has to play a primary role. In other words, what is the best thing for Dennis? And, and part of that will be um, having some respect for Dennis's decisions. But part of that is also going to be trying to preserve Dennis's life so that Dennis has a future and can make his decisions about the rest of his life precisely because he has a life in front of him. Um, and so I think um, in situations like this where you're dealing with an adolescent, it may be appropriate sometimes to say, I respect where you're coming from, but, but, I, but I, I can't let you kill yourself. Um, I, that we, we have to preserve your opportunity to make this sort of decision in the future when you're uh, fully capable as an adult. Uh, now where I would probably draw the line is with the use of force. I, I do not think it's appropriate to use force um, to, to, to make somebody like Dennis have a blood transfusion. If he's going to physically fight, if he's going to pull his line out, those sorts of things, I don't think we can tie him down and, and force him to undergo treatment for the next three years that he doesn't want. Um, but I do think we should try. I do think that the assumption should not be that he's mature enough to make this decision, but the assumption should be that uh, we should make an effort, uh, even though it's not the decision he, he um, seems to be making. My understanding is that he did verbalize that he would physically resist attempts to transfuse him. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I guess in trying to sort of nuance an approach to this, I, if I were sort of approaching Dennis today, I might suggest that um, although he has made that statement, it doesn't necessarily mean he'll act on it. Uh, and, and so I, I would attempt to hang blood in, in his situation and, and go into the room with the blood and say and, and recognize that he doesn't want this done and apologize to him for the fact that we feel we need to do this and attempt to do it uh, and if he doesn't physically resist to carry through um, if he does physically resist in the way he's potentially threatened to do that then I think you need to step back and, uh, and try to re-engage but um, but I do think you should try I think the primary pr principle that governs what we do, at least in the healthcare setting, is the principle of beneficence. If, if you, even if you think about the goals of healthcare, the goal of medicine, the goal of nursing, the goal of occupational therapy and social work, and all of the uh, the kinds of professions that go into taking care of patients, uh, they're all directed at the welfare of the patient. They're all driven by beneficence. It's all about doing what we think is the will enhance the good of the patient. Um, that doesn't mean that a principle like respect for autonomy isn't important, but, but in many ways it serves the principle of beneficence. One of the reasons we, we have uh, the sense that we should be respecting the autonomy of others is that usually, at least with competent adults, they're in the best position to tell us what's best for them. In other words, as an autonomous, autonomous adult, you can tell me, as your physician, what you think is best for you. And so in, some, in many ways, these two principles don't conflict so much as, as come together. Um, part of respecting autonomy is recognizing that you can tell me what the beneficent thing for you is, and you're 
current situation. Um, as a pediatrician, I much prefer the, the, the bigger principle. Uh, we, we have uh, sort of fallen back on referring to a principle of respect for autonomy, but, but the truth is if you, if you go back uh, to when these principles sort of first um, got discussed by philosophers and, and ethicists, it was really the principle of respect for persons. And respect for persons is a bigger principle than respect for autonomy. Uh, respect for persons, for example, is something you can do to a five-year-old who may not have any autonomy at all, but nonetheless may have a personhood that can be respected by treating them in a certain way or treating them uh, one way versus another. And so respect for persons, I think, is also um, an, an important way to think about this principle that we've kind of uh, minimized to respect for autonomy. It's not all about autonomy. It's also about how you treat persons.